So um, let me just welcome everybody um, and welcome our two panelists and say that the, the, the timing of filming this here in October 2017 is really fortuitous because it comes in wake of the 10-part uh, Ken Burns PBS series on the Vietnam War. And I'm going to ask the two panelists later on for their opinion of that series. Um, it has ha had its critics. Um, it's had a lot of folks uh, praise it. Uh, I found it to be really informative. But there's a line from Ken Burns that I think is a, is a really the accurate uh, way to start this. And he said recently that, um, that he felt it was a time for a conversation about a war we have consciously ignored. And I want to get into why you two guys, if you believe that, and, and why you believe that that was the case. Um, if you look at some of the statistics, kind of uh, overwhelming. Two thirds of the uh, Americans who served in the Vietnam War are no longer alive. Um, 2.7 million Americans roughly served. 850,000 are still with us. And some estimates are 390 vets who served in the Vietnam era um, are lost each day. Uh, we think it's really important to hear those stories and for those stories to live on. And um, you'll hear me referring back to the Ken Burns series often because it left such an impact on me. And the video of, of the in-country activities, the battles are, uh, that, that video is incredibly powerful, but I think the most poignant part of that series was the, the comments made by the individual vets. And um, we have two uh, vets with us today, and we're honored to have you with us. First of all, thank you for your service. Welcome home. Um, and I, I want to try to, aside from this framing this event, try to stay out of the way and, and hear from Eugene Overton and Gene DiGiacomo as much as possible. So first of all, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for agreeing to participate in this. Um, I want to start out, if we could just do an introduction and tell the audience um, what branch of service you served in, what were the years you served in, and then I want to really jump right into it. Well, you know, thank you for uh, putting together this, this forum to help folks uh, understand uh, a little about war and uh, the effects that it has on generations. Uh, again, my name is Eugene Overton. I'm a native Staten Islander, born and raised here. Uh, I went to PS20, public school in Port Richmond. Uh, at the time, went to the eighth grade. Uh, from there, I went to Port Richmond High School. I graduated in uh, June of 1964. Uh, at the time, Vietnam was something you read in the newspaper and kind of knew some things were happening out there in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, until, I guess, around 65, uh, I started seeing friends of mine you know, being drafted or you know, joining. I didn't go to college right away. Uh, I didn't want to impose on my grandfather, who wanted to uh, pay my way at the uh, University of Southern California. Uh, uh, he wasn't a, a rich man, and he had uh, a settlement from his job injury. And I said, you know, Gramps, you know, you enjoy your life and enjoy the funds. I'll earn my way, and I start going to school at night. Uh, well, lo and behold, in uh, October of 66, I got a, a letter in the mail, come home from work, and uh, my mom was a little nervous. Dad hadn't gotten home yet, and says, well, it looks like there's a note from the draft board, and open it up, and uh, greetings from your friends and neighbors. Uh, <laughs> report that uh, on Whitehall Street, and uh, God, it must have been October 21st, 22nd, 
1966, you are now drafted. So well, that's how my experience started. Gene? Yeah, uh, my name is Gene DiGiacomo. Uh, I'm not a native Staten Islander, but my parents were. My father was a fireman here years and years ago, and they had transferred him to Brooklyn, and that was when the Staten Island Ferry was the only transportation. As a result, he moved us to Brooklyn because he was served, he was a fireman on, in Brooklyn on 18th Avenue. But I came, I came back, I came back. Uh, my history is, uh, I was uh, on my second, I had finished an apprenticeship program, a critical trade pre apprenticeship program, and I wanted to continue on with engineering. So I had gone to Brooklyn College to see what I could get, and they warned me, they said, before you go any further, check with your draft board. And at that point, I was 23 years old. So the furthest thing from my mind was Uncle Sam's gonna be looking for me. I was well aware of the war, and I didn't have too many opinions which, which was which. When I went to the draft board, they told me uh, I was up to getting drafted in about two or three months. So that left me with a situation where what, it, what I was going to do. I was gonna join the Marines. That's what I was gonna do. My dad almost killed me. <laughs> and he told me this, he went, did some research and he found out because of my uh, trade skills and the apprenticeship program I went to, I qualified for a petty officer program in the United States Navy Seabees. And that's what I did. And I enlisted, I went into the Seabees, and I put my time in, and I ended up 13 months in Vietnam. Mr. Overton, you, you touched on, and I wanna go back to your awareness of the war. So you mentioned you it was something far away in the newspaper and then it began to become more real when you saw friends. T t tell me more about your, your awareness leading up, up to it. Uh, well, again, it, it was, wasn't much media coverage like uh, happened once the activity in, in country, you know, got full swing. Uh, not much other than periodic stuff. You may wind up uh, seeing that it made the newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, again, I'm, I'm talking about, I graduated high school at 17 in, in 64. Uh, you know, my biggest thing then was, uh, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life right. and uh, uh, find a job and try and save up some money and go to night school. Uh, so, Gene, Gene DiGiacomo, talk to me about the, the time leading up to... Uh, well, I, when I knew I was gonna go in, I, I really, really delved into the war to see what was what. Uh, I, I did a lot of background reading and uh, of course the younger people out there will not understand this, but uh, at that time, there was the domino effect in place. The Cold War was rampant, uh, and we were worried about communist spreading. And that's pretty much what lit my fire and a lot of other guys. We didn't want communist to, communism to spread. And uh, for that reason, I felt I had to do my duty. Tell, tell me about the moment when you do open up that envelope and uh, you open up that envelope and you realize Uncle Sam is in fact calling. There was a lineage in my family of military service that went back to the Spanish-American War, from what I could find. And while I wasn't eager to go ahead and, and say I got my draft notice and I can go and join for three or four years, I said, well, if I get drafted, I'd taken some college courses, and I had a halfway decent head on my shoulders. I thought maybe I'll qualify for something else other than infantry. Uh, so that was kind of uh, the mindset. Um, we did talk briefly when I got the draft notice, uh, and then again later on, I'll talk about, but uh, the Overton family is, is spread out. Uh, Florida, California, Toronto, Canada, Windsor, Canada. Uh, so the question, you know, back in 66, while, you know, 
you could go spend time with Uncle Will in, in Toronto, but I didn't see that as, as an American citizen, uh, an option of uh, shirking my duties, and uh, I got drafted. Gene, talk to me about the moment where you, in your mind, you, you, you know you're going to Vietnam. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, when, I, when I joined, and I signed into the CVs, uh, as soon as I got to my, my boot camp, which was Gulfport, Mississippi, uh, first thing my DI told me was, all of you guys here, all going to Vietnam. So brace yourselves for that. There's nobody going anywhere else. We need CVs in Vietnam. So whoever gets out of this unit's going to... So, then I had, to, I had to deal with a lot of things, and uh, uh, I had an emotional thing about, I, don't, I went into the CBs because, okay, uh, I wanted to help. Uh, I rethought my, my thoughts about being a Marine. My father convinced me that. So I felt, okay, I'll go, but maybe I could do some good. Maybe uh, I could do things other than fight a battle. Maybe I could build, maybe I could do something and help the country with whatever they need. And unfortunately, that led me into a unit of, uh, well, I don't want to call us advisors, we went out on detachment. Uh, when I went to Vietnam, I was never with the CBs. For the 13 months I was there, I was never with a CB. I was with the 3rd Marines for a while. I was with, uh, uh, I was out in Quaviet with a unit out there. I ended up in an advanced tactical support base for the rest of my tour for nine months with Riverines, Riverettes, as you know them. And I ended up, unfortunately, in combat a lot. So that caused me a lot of problems later on. I want to, um, I want to get a, an understanding, or a better understanding, of those first moments in country. And <laughs> at, at such a tender age to process the stuff that you were seeing immediately, this thinking about what you might see, how do you, how do you begin to come to grips with that, or do you not? Do you not come you to grips with that for a long time? Uh, I remember my first day, we landed in Da Nang, and uh, we were waiting to get transported out because my original uh, base was Quang Tree. That's where I was going to start out. So we're all sitting around uh, Da Nang, and uh, this is my first day. Now you step off the plane and. And Gene could, no matter what they told you about the heat or the air, no matter how many injections they gave you of whatever, when you stepped off that plane, the air that you breathed in was like 10, 10 pounds going wow. down. That's how heavy it was. So we're sitting there and we're waiting for our trucks and sirens are going off. There's a, an F-4 that's circling the airport because he can't get his gear down. And he's circling and he's circling. And he, of course, was out in the distance. And he tried to make it a landing. And he came down. As soon as his the nose was playing, his gear wasn't down. The nose of the plane hit the ground, and the plane burst out in flames. And the guy, from what we, he couldn't get out of the, couldn't get out of the plane. So I said, oh, that, Jesus. That was your welcome. First day. Welcome to Vietnam. Eventually, after training, which I volunteered for Airborne, I wasn't going to be a finance clerk, I found out. <laughs> Uh, they told me, uh, Gene, you're going infantry. Uh, so I opted, if I'm going infantry, I want to go with the best. And the best inf infantrymen that I knew were airborne. So I volunteered for airborne. And I had a stroke of luck initially because after jump school, I was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division, stateside. The reactionary force for the president and anything, you know, they're going to keep the 82nd stateside. So that may not be too bad. I get a chance to have fun, parachute jumping. Uh, equipment didn't make it all that much fun as I originally thought about it. It was kind of arduous. But uh, I did four months with the 82nd Airborne Division at uh, Fort Bragg, only to have the 101st Division receive orders for the rest of the division to deploy to Vietnam. And at the time, they had three to 4,000 soldiers in the division stateside that had served in Vietnam already. And at the time, as opposed to now, 
multiple deployments were voluntary. So you had 3,000 guys who said, you know what? Uh, we've seen the elephant and uh, we've seen what war is like and we're not going back. They didn't volunteer. So they went to the 82nd and the 82nd had to transfer 3,000 people to earn it in first. Where I went to Charlie Company, 1st Battalion of the 506 uh, Infantry Regiment. Trained as a unit, uh, as opposed to what you see and hear a lot about people going as single replacements. Uh, I wound up becoming a squad leader and uh, trained and knew eight other men quite well. Uh, so, December 3rd, 67, we stepped off uh, our plane <clears throat> at Tan Sanuk, uh, outside of Saigon. And like Gene says, the first thing that hits you is the heat. It, it, it takes your breath away. Uh, the second thing is the odor. <laughs> uh, Vietnam had a distinct smell that you remember the rest of your life. So, so Gene, uh, you are in country, it, what, remind me again, what year is it? When I was in 69, 70. Okay, and the, and the reason why I ask, you said 67, sir. The reason why I ask is, tell me about when you land, the, the attitude, the prevailing attitude of the troops already there uh, is, and, and does that change during your time in country? I mean, when you got there, what was, what, well, what did the other, the guys who had been there for a while, what were they saying? Uh, I, you see, I can only speak for what I experienced, okay. all right? Because uh, as Gene could verify, across the country there was all kinds of other things going on. Uh, because my unit was a volunteer unit, everybody was pretty much gung-ho, all right? Uh, we, we, I worked with, like I said, I worked with the 3rd Marines uh, for about two months, and uh, they were great guys. They were all gung-ho. They were all gung-ho. Yeah, okay. But different, different things comes into place there. What's important to understand is that when things got thick, there was not an American flag flying in front of your face. When things got thick, you were just worried about your own ass and save that and work with your buddies to get out of it. There was no John Wayne stuff, you know, that never, anybody that says that that's the way the war went, it's my war, did not go that way. Um, like Gene said, different years of the war, uh, different things were happening. Uh, and what I mean by that, when I deployed in, in December of 67, uh, and I left country when my time in service was up, uh, October 17, 68, I landed at McGuire Air Force Base. Uh, we trained as a unit. We weren't replacements coming in. Uh, we were airborne, so you had, uh, I guess, a, a gun-ho attitude, as, uh, mm -hmm. as Gene said, about uh, getting the job done. Uh, the, the job was to, as we understood it, and so on understand it, is to help support the government counter-communism. Uh, so, uh, 67, 68, we had, a, I think, a, a different mindset as to attitude towards uh, war as opposed to vets I've talked with in, say, 80, uh, 70 or 71. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I, I don't know how to broach this topic without it sounding kind of Tell me what your in-country ex experience was like, because I, I can just imagine it could go so many different ways. It's, it's so general of a question, but let, let's start it this way. There are going to be people watching this video, God willing, mm -hmm. 5, 10, 15, 20. Start to tell that audience what you want or you believe that they should know about your in-country experience. Well... What I've learned about my in-country uh, experiences, the phrase war is hell, is that doesn't do justice. Uh, it doesn't solve anything. There we lost 58,000 men. 
I, I don't I don't even want to get into the MIA issue. And uh, the government played games with us. That finally, finally is coming out about what happened to the war. Uh, we didn't know that at that time, but when you got into it, you really didn't care. You were scared to death. You just wanted to come home alive. And, and the things that happened in the war, to me personally, I deal with today. I deal with guilt. I deal with a lot of things. So if anybody says that there is justification for war, I cannot see it. There's no good that's come out of war. Show me maybe World War II. We had insane people there trying to take over the world. Vietnam, I, I, I just can't see it. I, we lost so many men. They lost three million people. So what was accomplished? They have communism, but it's a capitalistic type thing. So my, my experience is it's terrible. Uh, it doesn't help um, justify what happened over there, what I saw and what happened, what I did. And I could, I could go on and on, but. Mr. Overton, what's the, what's the. Well, I, I agree with what Gene is saying is uh, war is not a, a pretty thing. And to commit what I call the national treasure, the, the, the U.S. military, to war has to be done with uh, a lot of forethought. And I'm talking about right now, what my view is now, is that uh, I believe there needs to be a draft, in which case all citizens, male and female ladies, uh, perform military service. It, it develops a, a sense of teamwork, a sense of what it takes as a team to get a job done for a purpose. There needs to be a, a purpose behind um, or, or, or a goal. And it, sh it shouldn't be borne by a small number of, of folks as is currently happening. Uh, you know, let's increase the soldiers pay, let's make it an all, all volunteer army so someone else has to go do the dirty work, not me, my son, my family. Uh, that view is based upon what I personally went through as a squad leader and a platoon sergeant in the 101st Airborne Division. As a squad leader, I was responsible for up to eight or nine men. As a platoon sergeant, it could be 30 to 34 men. Uh, like Gene says, the, the things that happen and the decisions that need to be made that affects every one of those men uh, carries a toll. Uh, my experience was after Ted hit uh, in, in January, uh, when Ted hit, uh, my unit happened to be out, out in the field, which I guess was probably one of the safest places to be as opposed to around uh, one of the big uh, metropolitan areas or or cities. Uh, but after Tet, where Smolin took one brigade at 101st, that I was involved in the 3rd Brigade, uh, you're talking brigade is going to be in a neighborhood of 1,800 soldiers, uh, 2,000 soldiers uh, in the infantry units. And we were the reactionary force for any division in Vietnam that was having, having problems. So as opposed to uh, the 173rd who may have been at, at NK or the, or, or the 25th at, at Kuchi, uh, we kept on the move, moving from trouble spot to trouble spot to trouble spot. Um, when my unit <coughs> deployed, uh, NCOs, you know, squad leaders and above, there were 21 in a unit. Uh, two months before I left country, uh, of the original NCOs that 
that deployed, there was only three of us around. Wow. I can only think of, of one buddy of mine who uh, uh, managed to leave country early because his service dates were the same as mine, but he, he was wise enough to register for a fall semester for college, and he got to uh, get what we call a 30-day drop, so, so he left in, in September. But when you get to know people, you get to know their pluses and their minuses, you, you get to recognize uh, who's on point, not so much by name, but how we walked, how we held his head. Uh, you, you got to know uh, a, lot about <clears throat> a lot about their family life and to slowly, one by one, uh, you wind up losing a, <clears throat> a lot of close friends. It, uh, like Gene says, it, it carries a heavy weight and the politicians at times, uh, I feel if they haven't served in the military, they need to, while in public office, I don't know, you can agree with me. While in public office, they at least begin begin to reserve if they haven't had prior military unit. And unless you are, God, you know, I started to say unless you have a a, a critical injury or or a physical issue, I can't even say that anymore. Because I know Afghan and uh, Iraqi soldiers who are multiple limbs, and you know what they did? Instead of taking a military retirement, they found a job to continue serving. Everyone should serve. And when it gets to that level, and the politicians have to think about where their sons and daughters are gonna be, the attitude towards war, I believe, is gonna change a little. Mr. Overton, you went to a place that I, I wanted to go to, and that is try to help us understand I'm not sure if the right word is, uh, it's beyond camaraderie. The, the, the relationships that you build when they're folks meters away or miles away shooting bullets and bombs at you. Just, I know it's difficult to describe, but just begin to shed some light on for us the, the friendships and the bonds that you build and then, as Mr. Overton alluded to, too often the case where some of those friendships are shattered in an instant. Well, the word, the word is, and it, within my organization, VVA Chapter 421, uh, we emphasize the word brotherhood. That, it's, not, it's not a friendship, it's a brotherhood. And I strongly believe in that, and that as again, I can only speak for where I was and who I served with. There was no color issue within my units, all right? We had seven or eight boats. We had, uh, I don't know how many different, different types of boats. We had, I don't know how many men. My advanced tactical support base that I was on carried 40 people, only 40 people, all right? But there was, and we were all mixed, there was no color. There was no color barriers. Everything was the brotherhood. We, we, we died when somebody died. When one of the boats came back in pieces, we died when they died. It, it, it always takes a piece out of you. And that piece, uh, I'm sure Gene will agree, that piece could never be replaced. When you see, a, not a friend, when you see a brother, when you see a brother drop down in combat, that's a piece that goes away. Because you're sitting there at night saying everything that he had was taken away. And, and you start to think about the repercussions, the, the fall uh, from all out there. Now he's gone, now his sisters, his brothers, his mothers. It's just, it just tears apart a whole family. There was a, a, a scene, a segment in the Ken Burns series where they have a North Vietnamese soldier. And his quote was, when one of their soldiers was wounded or killed and another ran up to retrieve the body, we were able to shoot them too. And it was just, 
he didn't say it with any glee, but it was so matter of fact. Um, I, I want to, you, you mentioned race, and I want to get Mr. Overton's take on this because um, certainly the United States in 65 and 66, when you were headed out, was a segre segregated community in, in, in many ways. Um, talk to me about race as you were leaving and then in country and then we're going to get in a little while to the experience that you guys had coming home but but talk to me about your experience of being in the service in in, in that time and race well like for me uh, like Kuchin says it wasn't a matter of uh, black or white or Catholic Protestant or, or Jewish uh, it was a, a soldier that you were training with that you were going to have to rely on. Uh, and in each of our hands was one another's lives. Uh, that <clears throat> forms a very strong understanding of uh, the individual, uh, what that individual's strong points are, what, the, what his weak points are. Uh, were, and as a squad leader and, and a platoon sergeant, you had to identify these to make the unit function together as one entity, not eight or nine people, or 30 people off doing a thing, because everything we did was to support one another to see that uh, we made it for 365 mm -hmm. days. Uh, a one-year tour in the Army. Uh, race, we, wasn't an, an issue. Sure, there were fellows in the unit that liked country music. There was <laughs> guys in the unit that liked soul music and, and Motown, absolutely. But uh, uh, there, was a camaraderie there that is, uh, you know, like Gene says, uh, I have fellows that I, I serve with that uh, are closer than cousins. Wow. There was another um, scene in the in the series where there's uh, Mr. Musgrave is his name, if I recall correctly, um, and he it was I thought it was one of the most powerful scenes, and he talking about his view of the enemy, and he said very slowly, very deliberately, very passionately, my hatred for them was pure. And I was so scared of them. And the scareder I got, the more I hated them. Mm. Talk to me about, I mean, did you allow yourself to have emotions about the enemy or was, talk to me about your mindset about. The hate, the hate was because they were trying to kill me. Uh, again, I'm speaking for myself. The hate was because I wanted to go home and they were going to prevent me. I didn't hate them because they were communists. That, that didn't even come into the picture. You know, we, where I was uh, on the Cambodian border with this advanced town support base, we mainly dealt with the NVA. And I don't care what anybody says, I couldn't have more respect for them that no matter what we threw at them. As warriors. As, as warriors. No matter what we threw at them, they kept on coming. We had, a, there was an area off this Van Kodang River where the Ho Chi Minh Trail came in. It was a big supply unit. We worked with the 9th Infantry. We kicked them to death. We beat them to death. And they came back. And they came back. Yeah. Mr. Overton, your, your, your comment earlier about all of us having to be part and, and owing a, a, a service. It made me think of the, 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 the women, the kids, and I, rightly or wrongly, that the, the North Vietnam, we bombed the crap out of the Ho Chi Minh Trail and then immediately women and children with spades going back and rebuilding it. Um, and they, they, they seemed at least I got from the, the, the series and stuff that I've read, that, that there is a, I don't know if respect is the right word, but this begrudging 
respect of um, the tenacity as warriors that they had. And I think the rush of emotions, of various competing emotions, obviously I get if, um, you know, your buddy was here today and he's not, and those guys killed him, the emotions that overcome you. But um, I think just it, it adds to this cauldron uh, that I guess we're trying to understand of the various emotions that, that you guys had in, within an hour, let alone a day or your tenure in, in, in Vietnam. Well, you know, that's one of the things as a, emotions as a, a leader, you really had to concentrate it and, and make an effort that those emotions, uh, just because Ralph on your left died or Frank over here got shot, that tactically you just didn't want to go up and, and, and try and, and charge the enemy. Uh, after Tet, what, what we fought was mostly the North Vietnamese soldiers. Uh, we used to call him Mr. Nathaniel. <laughs> uh, you gave the man respect because he was shrewd, he was tenacious, cunning, and he was looking for a weakness in your armor to explore. And if you let your emotions uh, take over, it wasn't just you that was doomed, but the people with you. Mm. That, that that extra burden of leadership is, uh, and and knowing that you're responsible for, as you just said, not only for yourself but um, for the lives of others. I mean, one of the things that's, that still uh, amazes me, you know, to this day, to have a a bunch of fellows that you serve with, and you're in a you're in a situation where, if you stay where you are, where you're at at the time, uh, you're doomed. Mm -hmm. And you know they talked about in, in tactics when you when you get hit in an ambush, move forward, uh, move through the ambush. Uh, it sounds crazy. Mm. Someone's shooting at you, and you're going to keep moving forward and, and firing and uh, attacking the enemy. Uh, but when you sit back and, and think about it, it's a lot harder to shoot at a moving target that's moving fast at you as opposed to a target that is stationary or running away. Uh, and it works. Hmm. Talk to me about um, bravery. I, I've been doing a lot of reading since the series and I actually watched, uh, listened to a podcast on uh, Mike Thornton who was a, a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, uh, Navy SEAL Vietnam, um, talk to me about well, human beings exceeding sort of human limitations and, and, and um, the bravery that, that, that you witnessed. Uh, well, the, the unit I was with, uh, 594th uh, Rib Division, they had a, every once in a while, we had this uh, SEAL team that used to drop in and we used to have to drop them in. We used to drop them into the mangroves, into the jungle, and they would be gone for two, three weeks, and then somebody else would pick them up. I could not imagine that. Wow. That to me is bravery. Bravery to me is, is the fallen. Uh, I don't, my experience with combat was, everything was a reaction. You, you're, you're doing nothing, and all of us, in a split second, everything just opens up on you. And sometimes you know what you're doing, sometimes you don't, sometimes you burn out your barrel, you know? You, it's, burn I, out I your barrel mean? It, it's not to me, it was just instinct. B burn out your barrel mean you just keep firing? What yeah. does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. You fire so much that the uh, barrel of your M16 or, or M50 got so red hot you burnt it out. Wow. You couldn't effectively fire any further wow. rounds. But I, I like to tell a quick story sure. about, about one soldier, Tom Kirk. I have not been able to locate him after all of these years. But we went over as a unit, we were all airborne. Uh, a large percentage, I want to say, of the records I've been able to find, uh, 100 
in five out of 130, there was only five or six draftees among us. So it was all RAs, regular army. So these are all people who volunteered, trained hard. In March of 68, we started to get replacements due to the losses, and they were no longer jump qualified. Uh, I used the word jump qualified. Back then, we used a word called leg. A leg was any individual who wasn't airborne, and a leg was not worth his weight in salt. Okay, uh, that attitude changed with Tom Kirk. Tom came in the unit in March. He was chunky. I don't know how he got out of basic and AIT at the weight he was. Uh, when a new guy comes in, you got to kind of scope him out, and see what you want to do with him. You're an ammo bearer. You carry six, eight hundred rounds of machine gun ammo, and your machine gunner will tell you what to do. But along with all your other equipment, he may be carrying 150 pounds of equipment and ammunition. Tom couldn't carry 100 pounds. Tom was with you Guys used to be on his case. I used to be on his case. Slowly, uh, he uh, developed some strength, lost a little bit of weight. <laughs> well, so he wasn't getting that chow that we uh, was used to, uh, you know, back at, at base camp or back in the states. And the early morning hours of July third, uh, we had been operating near Coochie, Trambang. We was the brigade was assigned with 25th Infantry Division. A lot of contact, a lot. But this one night, uh, we set up a night defensive perimeter. Uh, and we noticed off in the distance was a little hamlet. And the people were leaving the hamlet. Uh, gee, they got ox carts full of whatever they got in their little hooch. And they're leaving the area. Not a good sign. Mm. We sent out we call, call listening posts, around 150, maybe 200 meters in front of the unit defensive perimeter. And each platoon out of the four sent people out. Tom was on a, an LP with two other soldiers. Well, like we suspected, the MVA hit us, and they hit us hard. Uh, the listening post job is Early warning, claymores, uh, the device that shoots multiple pellets and clears a, a, a large path, uh, and get themselves back to the perimeter. Uh, they gave word back that the MVA had already passed their listing post and were in front and behind them. It, it, we got hit by three reinforced companies. And uh, Tom, though slightly wounded, made it back to the perimeter with the two fellows that he was with, dragging them, wounded, firing, stopping, <clears throat> himself uh, being wounded, and making it, <clears throat> making it back <clears throat> to the perimeter. From that point, I said, no what? If a guy served in 101st, and if you served in the 506, and you got a CIB, and you don't have junk wings, all that means he's not jump qualified, but he's airborne. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Let me, uh, let's fast forward this a bit, and let's talk about coming home <laughs> and the response you got and the response you didn't get. What were you expecting? Did you have any idea? Um, walk us through sort we're of hitting the, on something heavy. Yeah, the insult on top of the injury, or maybe the injury on top of the injury. T tell us so that the audience understands <sighs> what you guys endured. I remember uh, uh, none of it. None of it was good. And, um, none of my homecoming was good, other than when I got on my block. And the people on my block were there for me. The coming home, uh, 
I had a, a lieutenant, forgive me for saying this, some butterball lieutenant. Uh, and I was one, the NCO. Don't uh, put me up there. I was wanting to work. <laughs> when, uh, when I was coming home, uh, I had to wear you, my uniform. I was, I was done. And uh, when I was with these uh, river rats, they awarded me their beret. And they wore a black beret. And I had that beret to this day. And I was proud of it, you know, and I, I was st standing there in my uniform and I had my ribbons in my pocket like this because issues that I have, I didn't want to wear them. So as soon as they left the base, I put them in my pocket and I'm standing at the airport and I get this butterball lieutenant. Butterball means this guy was nowhere. He just finished his basic or whatever. And he comes around and looks at me and he says, what's this? So I said, what do you mean, what's this? He says, what's that hat? I said, it's not a hat, it's a beret. He says, well, you're out of uniform. I said, it's part of my uniform. And he says, what's this? He says, what are your ribbons? I said, look, Lieutenant, I just got it from the Vietnam. I'm done. I got my separation. I'm leaving. I'm wearing my uniform because I have to get on a plane to go home. He said, I don't care where you are. Vietnam, what the hell was that? This is an officer. <laughs> So I don't know it, but I've got, the, the plane is already docked and I've got the flight crew behind me. So he's threatened me that I'm not gonna get on a plane unless I take off the beret and I put my ribbons on. And this goes on and on and on. So he says, that's it, you're not on a plane. So the guy behind me, one of the pilot, who turned out to be the pilot, comes around, he says, what's, what's going on? So I said, well, sir, I just wanna get on a plane and go home. He, he asked what the problem is, we go over it again. And the, uh, the lieutenant turns around and says, this is my problem. He says, you kind of step back. So, <laughs> then the pilot looks at him and he says, you know what, that's my plane. <laughs> he says, that is my plane and you keep your mouth shut. He says, you get on a plane. So I get on a plane and this guy's all ticked off over the whole thing. Now I sit down on the plane, plane takes off. Uh, the stewardess comes back to me. She says, the captain would like you to come up to the cockpit. So I get up there and uh, there was another seat behind him that was vacant. I don't know. What it was. And I sat down and he wants to know my story. And he says, you know something? He says, I was a Korean War. He was a decorated pilot in the Korean War. He says, I don't know what you guys went through. He says, but if you get off that plane and there's any other trouble, and he gives me his card. That was the only good thing wow. that happened. One of our local guys, uh, got off the plane, he was wearing his Marine uniform at Kennedy Airport, two guys got in to the into the bathroom and beat him up so bad, he had a plastic put it in his drawer. And I could give you stories of when, uh, what was it, uh, Petriti, which was with that then, Staten Island Community College, yeah. how the demonstrations went there, the May Day demonstrations, how they single, they would single somebody out with a, a fatigue jacket on, right? That's where, the, that's where the term came in. We were closet vets. And there's guys still out there that are. I, Jim, I could give you, I, I don't know how many stories I could give you of, <laughs> there was no pleasantry about coming home. None at all. They blamed us for the war. You know? Gee, I'm sure you. When I left country, it was a, a commercial airline, it's a name I don't remember. And they flew, they flew us into McGuire Air Force Base, it made a couple of stops. And uh, at the time, it, it, the Army was trying to save money. If you look east of the Mississippi, they would fly you into McGuire and then pay you transportation costs home as opposed to flying you into Fort Ord in Northern California and paying your transportation from California home. So they flew us into Fort, McGuire Fort Dix is a, a joint base. And uh, as opposed to the West Coast, vets, soldiers coming back to the States, you had to go through a physical and things, 24-hour uh, processing. Here, we landed about 3, 3.30, and the medics were going home. Their day ends at 3.30, 4 o'clock, so they couldn't out process you. So that was the first shocker. What? <laughs> it's strange. So they, they told us you had a choice. You could 
go over here and get bed linen and stay on post. Or you can go over to the orderly room, uh, the company headquarters called the orderly room, and uh, you get a pass to go to Wrightstown, New Jersey. A small town in New Jersey with nothing right outside the post. So Gene said, you know what? Uh, where are their telephones? I'll, I'll wait till the line dies down. I don't like waiting on lines. I called my father, and within 40 minutes, Dad was at the gate of Fort Dix picking me up. <laughs> and I went home for the weekend. No pass, no, you know, I went home. Come back. Monday morning, I had just missed formation, and I was listed as, you know, missing formation. You know, this, this E6, who outranked me, uh, seeing me get out of my dad's car, and decides to give me a hard time. Oh, you're Overton. You know, you're misformation. You know, you know, I'm talking to you. Stand at attention. I'm going home. You know. So I said, trying to talk to him nice. You know, look, my dad's here. You know, you're going to embarrass me. Let's go over by the side of the building. My dad was very successful in convincing him that it was not healthy for him to go to the side <laughs> of the building. <laughs> and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but, when I got home, there was family, there was uh, uh, friends, a lot of support. And it wasn't, I got home in October, and it wasn't until I registered for college, go back to college in uh, spring semester, January 69, that I really started having problems. Problems in as much as I'm a Vietnam vet, and you have to wear your field jacket, or uh, back then, your government benefit check would be mailed to the college, and you had to go to the Veteran Affairs Office at College of Staten Island, which was headed up by Lee Covino at the time, mm -hmm. and you had a sign that you're registered, you had to show that you were registered for classes, and you would get your check every month. So every month, you go into the office, and there would be a dozen, 15, 20, college students lining up. Ah, here's some more of the baby killers. Here's, and, and they want to they get in your face. Uh, I was 21 going on 22. And uh, don't put your fingers on me. Don't get in my face. Mm -hmm. And uh, I effectively dropped out of school for a while. Uh, main reason, I didn't want to go to jail. One of these young kids get up here one of these days, and he have a bad day, or and I have a bad day, and you know, they would get hurt. It was uh, skills that you had learned were beyond sc schoolyard fights. So uh, hmm. there's a there's a quote that I read from. Uh, he might have been in the series. I don't remember, but he was in Vietnam in '68, '69. A guy by the name of Phil Joya. And, it, and his line was, that stayed with me was, when you're a soldier, you don't get to pick your war. You go where the government sends you. And um, it's a, a stain on this country, the treatment that you guys received. And um, I'm not sure how you, and, or if you find the forgiveness for some of the things that were said and done. Um, and it's certainly, I think, incumbent on the rest of us and I think we do a pretty good job. We've learned to do a pretty good job on Staten Island um, to demonstrate the respect and the appreciation that we have for you. And I think some of us are cognizant of what you endured when you came back. And um, I, I, I want to, I know we, we're probably going over a little time, but I, I, I want to I just do um, two things. One, I want to just ask you is, to, if there's something that we didn't cover or something that you, again, let's, let's be optimistic and believe that this is going to be seen by the next generation. Something that we didn't cover that you want to sh express. Well, the, the, the one thing I, I want to express, and, and, I, and I've said this at, at schools that I've gone to, is you cannot hold the soldier accountable for the government. A soldier 
does his job. He takes the oath, he believes in the country, and he serves it, all right? And that's where his commitment to politics is and ends, all right? So whatever the country does to whatever we think as, as a soldier, as someone that swears to our, our, our allegiance to the country, we put our trust that the country is doing the right thing. So, and that happened in Vietnam. We didn't know the politics, so we went to war. But it seems that the politicians, the people, excluding here on Staten Island, one thing I have to say about you gentlemen is of all the places I've been, there's no borough, no place that, that handles veterans the way they do. Donovan right now, with what he took care of the VA, all right? I don't know if anybody knows it. The VA, that business with the VA where they wanted to move it, you guys to have to move it. Yeah, the surgery, he got it down. So you guys are always there. But the rest of the people have to understand that no matter what goes on in this country, when somebody puts on that uniform, they have to respect it. And they have to respect the person that's wearing it. And, and it, maybe now it's, it's happening better. But uh, will I forgive? Never. Veterans Day to me means, honestly, most of the time nothing because of what happened when I came home, of what I saw what happened. And this country has, nev has never let that happen again. That's the message I have. Understood. Well, I guess what I like to say is uh, there's a saying, you know, learn from history. Don't repeat history. And, you know, I think that's what you young folks here in the audience uh, need to, to think about when it, it comes to, one, your civic duties, and two, what you vote for uh, and who you vote for, uh, I think is, is key. That, uh, so, you know, let's learn from history and uh, be smarter about what we do. And that's why, what I said earlier, I'm, I'm a firm believer that the draft needs to be brought back. Uh, and everyone does not have to serve in the military. There's community service. There's, if you're going to be a medical student, there may be some place in Appalachia that uh, you, you can work with a doctor, that there's uh, a need for a medical assistance or, or, or dental is a lot of things, you know, like my dad was in the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, you know, back in the uh, late 20s and 30s where they helped plant trees and help uh, your national park systems. Uh, so there's a lot of things people could do, but the benefit of what that service does in bringing people together from different backgrounds, from different nationalities, black, yellow, red, green, uh, and once you have an understanding, uh, it, it isn't, oh, that person or those folks. Uh, you, you walk away with a different understanding of people. These men here, they are heroes, and we need to tell uh, their stories. Uh, for lots of reasons, not the least of which is Mr. Overton refer, uh, mentioned about if we don't know our history, we are certainly uh, doomed to repeat it. Um, I want to thank all of you for your patience. Gentlemen, um, you have my admiration. You have my respect. Um, I don't believe I would have been able to do what you did at the tender ages that you did it. Um, I feel the responsibility, not as an elected official, but as a Staten Island, as an American, to play my role in trying to make amends. Um, if there's anything that we could ever do for you at Borough Hall, um, please ask us. It would be our honor. Thank you again for your service and, and welcome home. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.